Historically, U.S. firms dominated the private security company market in places like Afghanistan and Somalia. But in recent years, they've been merging, emerging in other countries. Warlords and militias have restyled themselves as private security companies. And in Russia, we have seen the incredible consequences of PMC Wagner rising as a force to challenge the reputation of the regular military. Wagner is also active in Africa, building a private military empire and extracting resources to fuel Russia's global power ambitions. The proliferation of private military forces is having a profound effect on international relations, meaning that the 21st century may have more in common with the 12th century than the 20th. This poses significant risks to democracies across Africa. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to help new people find our fantastic speakers. And if you enjoy the content, please do consider becoming a patron or buying me a coffee. Beverly Ochieng is an experienced journalist and commentator on socio-political, economic and security developments in sub-Saharan Africa. She analyzes political developments in the region, as well as security developments in West Africa and the Sahel. Beverly is a senior digital journalist and African specialist at BBC Monitoring. I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. And I should check, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you did. Good, <laughs> you did. good, because that's not always the case, and I, uh, I get <laughs> extremely embarrassed when I when I make that mistake. Um, you've done some extraordinary reporting on uh, not only insurgencies that have uh, been sweeping the Sahel region, but you've also been tracking uh, the pro well, progress is probably the wrong word the expansion of Wagner influence across the content. What what got you into that? Well, it was, so I started looking first at the Central African Republic at the time when the government was trying to negotiate a way of containing insecurity because of the rebel violence, but also legitimizing the presidency of Faust into Adera. So he had come in at the back of a civil war, a sectarian conflict, though all of these rebel groups that are still against the government, and he wasn't quite getting as much assistance from mainstream partners. So that's France, that's the UN, and they've had a, a big force in the country for a while. So he sought help from Russia. It's not very clear who approached the other. But Russia had an interesting way of providing assistance. So we know it's in the Security Council, which obviously means it is a powerful position. It has veto power. It's a permanent member. And Russia proposed sending in what it called Russian military instructors. And this was just about the time after the Crimean War, or the, the annexation of Crimea, and there were the little green men, and there were all of this speculation about what is Russia doing there? Who are these men? How are they operating? And then these very same men somehow found themselves at the very heart of the continent. And they were initially supporting the soldiers, giving instruction. But alongside that was this growing influence, I'd say, campaign diplomatically and security for Russian presence. And at the very start, they seemed quite successful. They were welcomed. There were questions about, you know, the credibility of their operations. Who were they running as command? Who was holding them accountable? And then together with that was this falling out from many countries, not just the CAR, but other Francophone African countries with Western support and growing interest in Russian influence and Russian presence. And for a long time, we know that the government there did not talk about the Wagner group, they talked about instructors. When it became quite prevalent that the Wagner group was the one that was operating there and the sophistication of those operations, not just in security, but also in the media, which is something that I tend to focus on a lot at monitoring. And also with business, it looked like a sort of modern age mercenary operation, which was fit for people who are becoming disgruntled, who could be easily influenced online and who could sort of galvanize popular support around a cause and around a group that was proving to be a problem for the international community. And I was quite fascinated by how they were doing that in tandem with working with governments that are legitimate, but also provoking tensions with longstanding Western partners. And of course, Wagner is not a charity, so it's not exactly clear what the support uh, or seed funding, let's say, from the Russian government was. But in terms of these relationships with governments around uh, across Africa, I would imagine that commercial contracts are involved. 
but it goes it goes quite a lot beyond that as well doesn't it and we'll come on to various uh sort of extraction franchises and what they're for um in the interview a bit later as well yeah, yeah, and you have to understand that the countries where the Wagner Group has been active or is active, so that the Central African Republic at the moment and Mali, prior to that, they were in Sudan very briefly towards the Darfur region. They were very briefly in northern Mozambique. These are countries that cannot afford the kind of security support that they would need to be able to fight against insurgent and rebel groups. So as a concession to that, the Wagner Group was taking in contracts in lucrative areas, minerals, you know, forestry and other sectors in order to run those operations. And it's interesting because for a long time, of course, even the Russian government itself distanced itself from what the Wagner Group was doing or these security contracts, but they were working at the behest of the Kremlin. It's come to emerge at least in recent months, particularly with you know the owner of the Wagner Group, Prigozhin, his rebellion, and the fact that he became quite close to the government. But that plausible deniability allowed the Wagner Group to take advantage of those contracts, to pay themselves for those services, to not quite be held accountable in the way that you would maybe the UN mission or a regional peacekeeping force, and also work with the government more directly in a way that was not likely to raise scrutiny or any sort of demonstration with the public. And we can only speculate as well about the usage of the resources that are being extracted, um, whether those are directly used um, within the Russian economy or whether they are sold, one would assume, at a great profit. Um, but do the operations map against specific resources? Is there any evidence that um, you know they're planning this kind of support because they know certain resources are available in certain regions? Well, it seems quite deliberate. I do recall there was one time, just after Prigozhin had martyred his rebellion, there was an image of him with a map behind him, and there were all of these pinpoints of places where obviously the group is active, but places where they have been targeting operations or where there's been speculation that they're likely to go in. So you're thinking about a place like DR Congo, which has lots of mineral reserves, and it's been bedeviled by insurgencies in the East for many years. And it seems like it was both strategic but also a sort of blunder that gave them a lot of opportunities. So the CAR was an unexpected frontier for Russia, for the Wagner Group, but it was a country that was vulnerable, which made it very easy to, you know, sort of exploit the security situation for there to be a financial venture. And there were lots of companies that were developed there. And one interesting place where all of this was operating from was something called the Russia House, which is the equivalent of Alliance Française or the British Council or even even the Goethe Institute. So the Russia House is a cultural center. You know, if you see it, the, you, you do Russian classes there. Um, they would do these outreach programs in Bangui. That's the capital of the CAR. But it became quite prevalent that the Russia House is also a place through which they would run sort of trade fairs to allow certain Russian business interests to invest in the country. And some of them were quite legal businesses, but they also enabled a lot of the companies that came to be affiliated with the Wagner Group to operate in a more legitimate front. And of course, we've realized with the sanctions that have been imposed by, you know, the EU, Canada, parts of the US against companies like Lobaya Invest or Bois Rouge or even one television station, which broadcasts both in the CAR as well as across the region, that these were ways through which they could pass along messages, but also be able to drive economic activities. With Mali, for instance, I think it wasn't just about, you know, we know that Mali has gold, it has cotton. But Mali is also very strategic because it came to emerge later on that Mali was being used for the Wagner Group to acquire weapons supposedly to be used in the Ukrainian war, which is where they have been more prevalently active over the last nearly two years. So that's a very strategic decision. And now it seems as if they're angling Mali's neighbors, that's Burkina Faso and Niger, where now we have military governments in place who are pushing out Western allies. These are countries that are not under any arms embargo, so it's possible to still use them as a conduit to be able to get weapons. And they're also countries with mineral reserves. Niger has uranium, Burkina Faso has gold. That's a strategic thing. Um, if you think about Sudan, 
there was Merrill Gold, which was the company affiliated with the Wagner Group, and they were also moving gold. And in northern Mozambique, there were the rubies. So it's a mixture of these are opportunistic ventures. These are dangerous areas where no one is likely to really put in many investments and places where people will turn a blind eye for a long time to allow the Wagner Group to build the kind of resilience it now has on the continent. And we'll come to their methods, but their methods must uh, involve a certain degree of fear, coercion and extreme violence, because these are characteristics that we see in Russia. These are characteristics we see uh, in Ukraine and Belarus, where some of the Wagner group fled after uh, the failed uh, mutiny. I'm assuming these same um, uses of, of violence without limits uh, is also prevalent in their operations in Africa. Well, yes, it's been documented quite a bit by local rights groups, international rights groups, and in some media outlets, especially those that are still able to report independently on what the Wagner Group is doing. So if I'm giving the example of the Central African Republic, there were reports of a scorched earth policy being used to fight against rebel groups, particularly in the northern and the eastern regions. There was a period when the Ukraine war had just sort of erupted, where there were there were some reports that the violence, especially near the border with Darfur, had escalated quite significantly significantly because they needed the resources, they needed to push out the rebels, and the only way in doing so was by ruthlessly killing people, as was being reported. And in there's been some particular reports of stark operations involving the Wagner Group alongside national armies. Of course, the respective governments in Mali and the CAR have denied this consistently. In the CAR, in the run-up to the 2020 election, there had been this huge push to get the rebels out to make sure that the country was protected and secure. People did welcome this because it was effective. But in the end, what also ended up happening were more, many reports emerging of communities that were perceived to support rebel groups particularly Fulani communities where rebel groups tend to be of the predominant um, uh, formation, they were being disproportionately targeted both by the national security forces, but in instances where they were operating with the Wagner group. Right now in Mali, there's been this big push for the army to retake vast parts of territory. They did this in the central region in 2022, just after the Wagner group had been deployed. There was a massacre that the UN had talked about, the Mura massacre, where it seems at least 500 people were killed. Many of them were men. Many of them were accused of harboring militants. And much of this violence against civilians rather than militants, even though the army itself that they said that they were targeting militants. And now in Northern Mali, as the army is trying to take over UN bases, there have been graphic images being shared online of executions that seem to be against civilians, against members of armed groups who are trying to protect themselves. And there was even one particular incident where there were children who may have been killed by mercenaries. The mercenaries themselves never really talk about it. They give a different spin of this, which obviously we will talk about. And the government's And I think it's because of that dependency, the fact that this is the group that will be able to support them. They either hesitate to talk about it or they dismiss the reports altogether. And in some instances, human rights activists have been targeted for talking about alleged Wagner atrocities. And these are patterns we see in Syria, patterns we see, of course, in Ukraine um, and Grozny, the two the two wars in Chechnya. Um, there, there, there seems to be form uh, in these kind of techniques and they're not accidental. They are definitely strategic. Um, how does that compare then to, say, the UN forces, the say the French forces um, of ex-colonial powers who may have held sway in the region before? One would assume that they are far more bound by, uh, you know, various international treaties, far more monitoring, far more accountability, possibly less effective at fighting uh, rebellions and so on. Um, is that one of the reasons that they're being displaced or usurped? Well, I mean, yes, part of the reason why we're seeing a big retreat, so with the UN mission in Mali in particular, there's been hostility towards the UN mission and the CAR, and even there's this big push to remove the UN forces in DR Congo, where Wagner is not present, but obviously it might, you know, want to to target that. 
is because people are impatient with the fact that the mechanisms used and the bureaucracy within which those forces operate with are not responsive to the way the insurgencies are evolving over the years. If you look at DR Congo, this is a force that's been there for more than two decades now, and the rebel insurgency is not abating. In Mali, even though the UN force had initially been welcomed together with the French forces, and in the very first year or so, they'd been very effective with pushing back the militant groups and restoring some sense of state security, they're not quite able to tackle some of the local tensions that have emerged as that have emerged from these insurgencies. So in Mali, for instance, the insurgency emanated from the feeling from Tuareg and Arab groups in the north that they were not being well represented. And they led this rebellion, which was obviously hijacked by militants. Now the French forces came in to push back the militants. They managed to you know, oversee a peace deal that was signed. The UN mission was there to help implement the peace deal. But that insurgency quickly evolved into something else. It was no longer about the separatist cause. It was about Islamist militant groups now taking advantage of an ineffective government to strike lawlessness across the country. And there was a period of tension between the French strategy and what the government in Mali had wanted. There were some calls for, you know, talks with militants, which were dismissed by the French because I guess the Western line is you do not talk to terrorists, but it's a very local dynamic, which was not being understood. The militaries themselves, the armies were quite frustrated by that international cooperation um, and the fact that it wasn't adequate to protect them themselves from attacks. And this is why you've seen the uprising or the military coups that have taken place in the Sahel. Part of it is misguided because if you look at the situation now compared with when civilian governments were in place, security hasn't improved, you know, by by any sort of margin. The presence of the Wagner Group, particularly in the Sahel, has been destabilizing. It's led to a climate of fear, which is the thing that we've just talked about, the fact that they carry out operations in a way that is seen to be indiscriminate. With the CRR, it's very interesting because the UN force and French forces themselves had been accused of abuses. Some of them were sexual abuses. And in a way, because those had not been adequately addressed, there was mistrust in the UN force as well as in the French forces. And this is a thing that the Wagner group sort of knows how to play with. And it's part of their propaganda, which we'll obviously talk about. But they were able to use that to then reduce the influence of those forces or the more mainstream forces and make them seem as if they're not upholding the principles that they should be upholding, if it's the UN Charter, if it's bilateral cooperation agreements. So they take advantage of that. And governments want to be responsive to the public because they also don't want to be subjected to criticism or military coups. So in the CAR now you have Wagner as a mainstay and in Mali you now have the Wagner group as a mainstay because it's in response to some popular support for an alternative to failed Western intervention. And let's tackle that informational uh, distortion issue or the propaganda. Um, so clearly they are taking real grievances and real problems and amplifying them. Once Wagner gets its claws into a country they don't stop doing propaganda, even though when they're in the ascendancy, if anything, doesn't it increase? And, and then they start weaponizing other narratives as well. Well, yes, definitely, because they do have to keep justifying their presence and to play up their popularity and to continue being part of public discourse in a way that is favorable to their presence. So if I think about the CAR, they've used a variety of things, both old school, and also new school. So old school is there's a radio station that is based in Bangui and it has relays across the country, except for in about three provinces. It's called Radio Lengo Songo. It broadcasts in the Sango language, which is the local language, but it also has some programs in Russian and some programs in French. It tends to host politicians from the ruling party, including the youth wing, which is called Galaxy National. And that's one way of making sure that that information is pervasive for a big part of the population that is not quite able to access the internet. I think internet penetration in the CAR is less than 10% and it's limited to the capital. So that's an interesting tactic. There were plans to open a TV station, not very sure what's happening, but that's another way of sort of expanding that presence. Now, in addition to that, they do have these on the ground campaigns. So I think the CAR is the only country that actually had protests in support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine 
And these were being run by Galaxy Nacional, which has often come out and held pro-Russia protests in various other contexts. And what you'll notice there is there's almost no distinction between the Wagner group and Russia itself. They're seen as one and the same. And then you think about the same thing sort of in Mali and Francophone Africa. So there's one TV station that's quite interesting. It's called Afrique Media TV. It's domiciled in Cameroon. It's believed to have been bankrolled by the Wagner founder, Prigozhin. It broadcasts in French. They hold all these long debates. They have news segments. They also rebroadcast RT, which is largely not av available in other parts of the world, but we're able to access it here. And it props up Russian narratives. It, it props up anti-Western, anti-French narratives. So that's another way of sending that message in a very broadcast form, but it's also very popular online. And then on the other hand, you have these, what I call pro-Russian civil society movements. And they've been going on for a long time. In Mali, one of the earliest ones I came across was from about 2017, 2016. It was called the Group of Malian Patriots. They had this one campaign where they were collecting a million signatures to ensure that Russian presence is stronger in Mali. And there was even a time when the Russian ambassador at the time attended one of their events and was photographed and it was even talked about by, I believe, the Russian spokesperson, the government spokesperson. Now, these groups, they talk to people on the ground. They do things online, of course. They have Facebook Lives. They have some campaigns. But they hold these campaign meetings where they would be doing things like no against the UN force or no against the French force. And these are narratives that work for the Wagner group. Now, having observed those campaigns, I think they're somehow assimilated in the Wagner messaging. So there's been cartoon videos that have been shared where they sort of parody France and they demonstrate that the Wagner group is the hero that the Sahel really needs. There was one very interesting one that I, I found really funny. Um, it was when the Al-Qaeda group in Mali had alleged to have kidnapped or taken hostage a Wagner mercenary in the central region. This was in April 2022. And then this video emerged online. No, th this Twitter account didn't seem to have any sort of affiliation or any clarity where it came from. And the video was showing a Wagner mercenary defeating the Al-Qaeda militant. And that was their way of speaking back. So that propaganda doesn't really change in terms of sophistication, but it responds to the issues at hand and makes the Wagner group constantly relevant in public discourse. And this feeds into, I mean, there's several strands here. and A lot of people won't be aware of the efforts made by the USSR in the 60s and 70s to reach out the sort of soft power, education power. A lot of people will also have received their education in Moscow. A lot of people from, from across Africa, South America and so on, will have, will have traveled to the USSR to, to gain degrees and so on despite one would suspect you know extreme racism which some of them may have experienced there there is this lingering sense that uh, russia is a benign rather than a malignant uh, influence are they also building on that sort of historic memory and historic soft power and they are creating a so-called anti-colonial narrative which does seem to play well well, yeah, they, they definitely are. So one of the times when it became really prevalent was when, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine. There was a wave of messages from their diplomatic accounts, their formal Twitter, Facebook accounts, where they were trying to raise public support in African countries for their side. They would really give a dominant narrative of what Russia has done, what it cannot be accused of. But at the same time, they would say things, a, a very simple thing like, Russia never colonized your country. They would tweet in Swahili because it means you're able to read the message and it resonates with you. And it continues to build onto that. They would, they would celebrate African leaders who have studied in the USSR and use that as a way of sort of stirring public support towards how well it has consistently been a, a friend and partner to African countries. And that's part of what they use to be able to lobby the votes in the UN where there was differences, of course, clear differences in countries that did condemn Russia and countries that abstained because for them, for various practical reasons, they wouldn't take a side on the war. And the Wagner Group has also presented itself as a sort of anti-imperialist force in that way. So the, the cartoon videos that I've talked about, one of the ones that struck me was one where they have Macron in his, um, in Elysee Paris, 
and he is frustrated because he's losing his former colony. So he's lost Mali to a military coup. He's lost Burkina Faso to a military coup. And he's likely to lose other countries like Cote d'Ivoire or even Niger, which he has now. And they try to show that France is really just this zombie force that wants to take over your natural resources and do nothing for you because you're still fighting terrorists. But the Wagner group comes in and is able to support your army. So you see a Wagner fighter together with a Malian soldier and they go and defeat the terrorist dragon that is both France as well as the militant groups. And that video also plays up this allegation that has not been proven that France supports militant groups. And you saw that narrative play out in the UN Security Council because Mali actually brought in a formal complaint saying that France is supporting militant groups and we do not want to be involved with them. We do not want them to be signing off on defense agreements for us on behalf of the Security Council. So these things sort of feed into each other. The fact that these Western powers and France and everyone is only in it for your resources and not giving you meaningful support. But well, we're here as an equal partner. We will stand next to you and we will support you. And we also want you to support us. And that was an interesting thing to watch. It's curious, isn't it? Because, you know, in tracking the, let's say, insurgent operations of Russia since 2014 in um, Ukraine, and actually before that, because for many years, they were investing in agents and assets and businesses and, and, and seeking to sort of undermine uh, people's commitment to, well, the country or the government they were part of. It's not difficult to imagine, and I'm not coming with any specific evidence here, but it's not difficult to imagine that part of the Wagner Russian playbook is actually to foster extremist or terrorist or insurgency groups to create or amplify a problem which you then come in and resolve is there any evidence of this strategy at play i mean at the moment not not at the moment i would say but obviously they do make the pro the problem seem quite big and they do try to play up western failure to tackle that problem so even in the diplomatic messaging um when sergey lavrov was in bamako at the start of this year he talked about how the French were abandoning Malians and people in the Sahel, you know, disregarding the fact that the Wagner Group's involvement and a lot of other internal issues led to the French pullout of in Mali. There were a lot of issues around that counterinsurgency operation that ended up being undermined. But they used that to play it back at them and say, because you're leaving a void, we are here to support them. And there's various other things that they do, of course, by trying to demonstrate that the West is not really in it as an equal partner to you. They're here to take advantage of something that you have so they can benefit from it. They leave you at war so that they can take advantage of those resources. And the Wagner Group has been playing up that propaganda, which is interesting. It allows, it, it, it's interesting because it allows, because the Wagner Group is already seen as being rogue or being you know, be, be beneath the law or above the law in some ways, they can play the extreme end of that narrative in the way that the Russian diplomats themselves, they just pick the top lines of it and talk about a failed friendship, a failed partnership and them filling in the void. And it, it does build that interesting relationship between them and what is played up and what is played down and how ultimately they're able to just take advantage of that void and consolidate their support in the region. I mean, they're all uh, tentacles of the same beast <laughs> in essence, yeah. and including, you know, the Russia House, which sounds like an extraordinary kind of uh, espionage novel, a John le Carré kind of uh, <laughs> set up there. Um, of course, Wagner has not been without its own problems. And apparently, Yevgeny Prigozhin is no more. I mean, there are still rumours, but has that affected operations in Africa? Has there been a kind of hiatus or a break in operations or is it business as usual? So it's a mixture of things, actually. So the first worry had been when he rebelled against the Kremlin and the fact that the Kremlin has wanted to consolidate the Wagner Group into the GRU, the intelligence, and probably have it overseen more formally by the Ministry of Defense. At the very start of that, there was no change. In fact, I think the CAR received two batches of mercenaries right before the constitutional referendum. And in Mali, operations continued as they should. 
And then Prigozhin made like a short visit to the region. It was a surprise, of course, the first video ever. He talks about fighting against um, militant groups on behalf of Russia. And then he died. And there was a strangeness to it because it felt as if him coming here was an acknowledgement of just how important the CAR and Mali were to him or are to him or are to the operations of the Wagner Group and to Russia. But his death meant that there was a bit more confusion about the loyalty of the Wagner Group forces, particularly if the Kremlin does decide to absorb them, which is what seems to be happening. So I do remember the initial media reactions in the CAR were, one, will the CAR still be in the good books of the Kremlin? You know, are they going to be able to get a leader who is both palatable to the government, given that they had a very good relationship with Prigozhin, as well as the Kremlin? And then in Mali, because they've never quite said they're working with the Wagner Group, it felt like business as usual. There was a milit there was a defense, um, there was a defense delegation from Moscow that came in, had meetings with the junta, and I suppose it was part of this reassurance that things will still be fine. We will maintain our footprint here. We will continue to support you, because obviously, if you pull out the forces now, these countries could essentially collapse. But I guess there's the question about the loyalties of the forces that will be there. I've always thought that there's a very autonomous way that the Wagner Group operated. They had a sort of leadership who took care of different things. In the CAR, it felt a bit more robust than in Mali. In Mali, there was one figure who was getting weapons from Turkey and sending them off to Ukraine. And of course, the Russian Mil Ministry of Defense seemed to coordinate you know, the batches of mercenaries who would leave and come into the country. In the CAR, you had a guy doing media, you had the person Russian, running the Russia house, you had the person doing defense, you had the person who was even like the security detail of the president to Adera. And all of these people were Prigozhin loyalists. There was an initial tension around whether they would continue to stay. It became prevalent that the Russia house head was changed. It seems that companies might be trying to reinvent themselves because many of them were sanctioned. And it does demonstrate just how much Russia may still need to keep this operation intact, even if it's just to have a foothold on the region, but also to assure those governments, we are really your friends and we don't want to disrupt what's happening here. But we want to make sure there's a formalized way of operating. So by all, you know, for all intents and purposes, in the CAR, operations are still going on in terms of frontline security. Propaganda campaigns, I, I think, have dipped in, a, in an interesting way. The influences are not as vocal right now, and maybe it's a wait and see what is the messaging we want to put out. In Mali, what I found extremely fascinating is after a year, personally, I was very frustrated that you hear about the Wagner Group, but there's nothing being seen. Lots of videos and pictures are suddenly coming out showing what they're doing in the northern regions. So that could be a slight change of strategy, um, but that will be interesting to watch in the coming months. And that's that's an interesting part about it, isn't it? Is that, uh, you know, when, um, I'm guessing when sort of foreign forces, French forces sort of make a mess or, or are present on the ground, there's potentially far less media control and, and you, you have more transparency about what's going on. Tying this up with the discussion about the extraction of resources and how little transparency is there, it does create the impression of a kind of, you know, heart of darkness kind of operation where you have a sense that terrible things are happening, but it's very difficult to get uh, either eyewitness or statistical information about it. Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's the work that some independent groups are still able to do. So I know of Accladin for the US firm, they rely a lot on ground sources to just document each and every instance where the Wagner group is doing something. Another thing is, even though French media has been banned from Burkina Faso, um, from Mali, they're still able to give the most prominent reports when it comes to atrocities that have been committed, or even the presence of the mercenaries. And also, interestingly, the armed groups in the northern part of Mali, when they issue issue statements about their confrontations with the armed forces, they do provide anecdotes of Wagner presence, which kind of helps with knowing where are they, even if you don't know what exactly they're doing. What I found a little bit more disconcerting, particularly with now the emerging propaganda or the videos or some of the evidence emerging from Mali is, you know, the thing you touch on, the heart of darkness. There was one video, two videos actually, that I'd come across, which presumably are either from the central region of Mali or the northern part, where they're handing out candy to kids. And these are kids who are presumably, you know, not, not within reach of food, 
One of them, I think, was almost naked. Another one was seated with a woman on the ground. And the caption beside it was something like, you know, providing humanitarian aid. So it it appears like a gesture of goodwill, but it sort of exploits the, the, the poverty or the, the impoverishment of the people who are living there. And the governments themselves, they haven't said anything about it um, because there's also the, this, the, the awkwardness of affiliating with this group. But then when you think about the narratives against France and against the West for exploiting the very same things or allegedly exploiting the very same things to serve this bigger cause, it almost feels no different. Or even the fact that there was a report actually of clashes between the mercenaries and the Malian armed forces in the town of Anefis in the north over food rations and provisions and six Malian soldiers were killed. There's been some reports not proven in the CAR of, you know, the command structure is quite broken. So you have mercenaries sometimes leading the armed forces and allegations of racism. You know, this is the kind of thing that is likely to provoke anger in other contexts. But in this context, it feels as if, you know, French media like to talk about how these governments are being held hostage. And so it's unlikely that they will criticize any such activity by the mercenaries. And if we look at the broader picture across Africa, it's not just Russia that is seeking to increase its uh, influence, uh, both sort of soft image, but also sort of more sort of hard, let's say, sort of extraction economy on the ground and industries. We have China. Uh, we have France historically, Britain historically. There are a lot of global powers that are looking to increase their influence uh, on the African content continent. So. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, that's remained the same for a long time. Of course, there's the ones who colonized France, Britain, Portugal. And then there's what you'd probably call emerging powers, though many of them are now just become a mainstay. So China has the Belt and Road Initiative. It's an it's a huge infrastructural undertaking. They've built roads, they built railways, they built bridges, and all of these developments that are supposed to increase access across the continent, especially when they're trying to create their own free trade area. And China will be able to take advantage of that. There's Turkey, which has a really huge influence in Somalia in defense, but also soap operas, which has been an interesting way of exerting soft power. And they are in the education sector. They're providing water to um, various residents. And now they have a media, the, 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 the state-run media outlet, TRT, which is broadcasting in a variety of languages, including, I think, Yoruba, the Swahili. That's another way of doing it. And the drones, which are being seen in Somalia, in Mali, in Niger, to support counterinsurgency operations. There's the UAE, which almost has a monopoly on ports across the continent, around the entire stretch. And it's another way of improving trade networks and interconnectivity, despite the fact that the UAE is largely eclipsed by other Arab League countries. And then, you know, now you have Russia and all of them. Sometimes it can be a complementary relationship. And, and I often try to think that Africa has a variety of partners now. And when you think about this assertion that sometimes the West is likely to scrutinize a lot more when it comes to corruption or allegations of rights abuses. This array of partners allows countries that would otherwise be locked out of mainstream aid to be able to access security, economy, education, and lots of other things. Um, but of course, it's at what cost does it come? So the Wagner Group, the cost is looking disproportionately, it seems to be hurting people a lot more. But overall, Russia does have legitimate interests in the region. They are in energy, um, they're in the economy. They're a very small partner compared with other powers, but they're also able to present themselves, especially now with the Ukraine war and post the Crimea annexation, as the acceptable partner across the board. And it's why there's so much contestation. So even in the UN, Africa has this unexpected influential role when it comes to how do we vote on different conflicts and where do we carry the most weight to make sure there's a consolidated global message on a global crisis. And are leaders seeking to utilize that leverage that they seem to have as we have a, you know, a worsening confrontation between the great power blocks? Does that give uh, you know countries and leaders in Africa some leverage, uh, especially within the UN and forum there, to perhaps you know push their agendas forward? Sometimes it feels like there's 
so obviously Africa is not homogenous and often I, I get very, you know, irritated by the idea of this homogenous idea of Africa. But at the same time, because they do have quite a block, it, it might help to have a consolidated message. There is the African Union, which would be pushing forward its consolidated message. And now it's even, well, part of the G20, which is one way of bringing in a, con a counterweight. When you look at the Ukraine war and you look at the voting patterns in the in the UN, the African Union itself did condemn the invasion and they did call for talks, which doesn't mean that it's particularly contradictory with the stances that African countries took. There were quite a number that did condemn the invasion and quite a number that did say that they wanted talks because a mediated solution is the only way the world would, for instance, access grain. And then as the war was now entering its second year, there was this di diplomatic mission by six African states led by South Africa to try to get both sides to talk. It wasn't very successful because ultimately there was a bit of pushback from Zelensky and you know, Putin was, he welcomed them, but he wasn't very committal on whether he would end the war or would be willing to talk to Zelensky on the terms that the world has been demanding. And immediately after that, the Black Sea grain deal was essentially, it collapsed, which it, it sort of felt like a failure on the part of the delegation. But I did, I think they did try to present the African side. And these other concerns in terms of representation, there's been a push for a long time for African countries to have a sort of permanent seat at the UN Security Council, because maybe then they'd be able to present their interests and not be a place where countries or powers use it as a proxy. Mali has become a dangerous proxy in the UN Security Council, which is partly what led to the withdrawal of the UN mission. This is the biggest withdrawal it's going to be experiencing. And we're seeing increasing, not just Russia, but even China sort of playing a disruptive role in that platform. So it, it goes back to so many things. They're so entangled. But I think African countries and leaders are trying to have a consolidated message, but because of some degrees of democratic decline and representation in some countries, it ends up undermining that messaging. And uh, probably the sort of, um, I've got plenty of other questions, probably this will have to be the last one because <laughs> of uh, uh, your, your precious time. This is slightly more abstract. And what we see in Ukraine and what many Ukrainian commentators have said is that this is a civilizational struggle. It's between different business models, dare I say, or different models of civilization, inverted commas, um, with Russia essentially having autocratic um, anti-rules-based system. Uh, if one was going to be super harsh, one could call it almost like a, an informal mafia uh, style uh way of doing business um and fear coercion terror and violence are elements that hold that model together i mean that is quite clear in russia and it's even more unfortunately clear in the occupied territories that terror coercion torture are significant parts of why it's holding onto those territories now this is a form of dare say it, civilization inverted commas um and it's in stark contrast, and it's very consciously positioned against the so-called rule of law, um, Western free trade uh, type model. Is this civilizational struggle yet spilling over onto the African continent? And I accept that there are a huge variety of different governments and systems and peoples. And there are many, many democracies, which, of course, have, have made tremendous strides in the last sort of, 20 years or so. Um, is there a danger that this sort of uh, clash of business models will spill over? Or is Wagner and Russia's presence at the moment much more kind of transactional rather than ideological? I mean, I feel like it is now veering into ideology and into the structures of particular governments and how countries work and how they relate with one another. And because these are countries that have already been vulnerable to some form of influence for one reason or another, whether it's political instability, whether it's insecurity, whether it's just a breakdown in the democratic system, it's made them more amenable to what Russia's actions are. So if I go back to Mali or the CAR, I mean, the CAR had for a long time faced waves and waves of violence. And it has tried to ascertain some sense of democracy, but even that democracy feels like it's under threat 
we've seen a constitutional change take place where essentially the president can stay in power for as long as he wants to stay in power. And he has almost absolute autonomy on authority over institutions that would presumably be independent. And this would, in theory, fit with what Russia wants. But there are people who are actively fighting against that and who are trying to call for accountability, whether it's politicians, civil society groups, youth movements, or even international and regional partners, to be able to challenge that from actually cementing itself around how the CR political system is. In Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, there's been the wave of military coups. And sometimes I make this joke that maybe soldiers are just sitting in a WhatsApp group and saying, oh, maybe you should be next and stabilizing one another. But ultimately we are seeing the repercussions of what instability does in influencing the regional structure of stability and how they relate to one another. So now you have the West African bloc that is really, really struggling, that's ECOWAS, really struggling to rein in a sense of democracy in countries that have fallen to military rule. But at the same time, there's a sense that this bloc, ECOWAS, and other Western leaders fail to see the warning signs of a possible state collapse in the countries where now there's military rule. And the external actors like Russia and even other players who are willing to fill the void, so to speak, that are taking advantage of that to be able to consolidate influence, power and their own economic and geostrategic interests. So it's kind of it's kind of influencing each other. And as a result, I, I, it does feel like a bleak picture where there's been a complete breakdown in democratic um, credentials, where you now have powers that are very hesitant to cooperate with the international community or the regional community, where there is, you know, media freedom is declining in these countries. Civil society movements do not feel like they can express a, a different opinion from what is the mainstream. You can't speak against the military junta. You cannot publish an independent report on military operations. You cannot talk freely about elections needing to be held without facing the backlash of either the juntas themselves or, you know, anti-democracy groups, so to speak. So I guess it feels it feels less op optimistic, but I do think the interesting thing that has had as has emerged as a result of that is a sense of nationalism, uh, and that's a bit complicated to explain. When Mali was sanctioned by the EU and by ECOWAS, everyone rallied against these two institutions, and it felt like probably one of the first few times there was a consolidated message. But that was still being taken advantage of because there are other people who are interested in other things in these countries. So there's a bit of a mix of that. So maybe not all hope is lost ultimately. That That's uh, an unusually sort of uh, optimistic note to end on. And I always welcome those little shards of uh, of hope uh, in in the gloom because it it, it uh, yeah various things can can seem quite desperate um and also we're seeing coming out of ukraine um this is a supplementary question by the way that i just thought of um we're seeing all sorts of techniques that are being developed in ukraine and then uh, you know taken perhaps a little too slowly, but taken on board by other countries to fight disinformation, fight propaganda. We're seeing software solutions being developed. We're seeing media literacy and various other initiatives that are actually having a degree of success at fighting back against Russian propaganda. I would say there's a long way to go to, to get these rolled out uh, within Europe itself, uh, let alone the so-called global South and in other parts of the world. But do you also perhaps hold out some hope that these techniques in fighting disinformation could be localized uh, across Africa to different local situations and, and help in this struggle? Well, yeah, there are definitely groups that are doing that. So in Mali, there's one particular group, I think it's called Benberi, and they do you know training for monitor for journalists and they roll out these reports where they debunk certain things that may have been circulating online. The UN radio, and it's so unfortunate that obviously the UN is leaving, the UN radio used to have this segment called Gré de Faux, which they would debunk this fake news story. And it was a very conversational style. So it was very adopted to how would people want to listen to it? It doesn't feel didactic. It doesn't feel like it's being shoved down your throat. It's, I came across this thing online. Do you think it's true? Well, let's talk about it. What does it talk about? And stuff like that. Um, 
And I think there's there's various independent journalists who are trying to push independent nar- narratives or counter narratives, even though sometimes there'll be questions about credibility or stances and other things. I think with the CAR, there's one website which we tend to use called Corbo News. It is the one that has consistently documented what the, the Wagner Group is doing, although sometimes they have their own slant, so you have to take it with a pinch of salt. And in other places, you know, in Sudan, there's a vibrant social media movement that are not just against the military rulers, but are also calling out disinformation, particularly by, you know, the paramilitary force, which is affiliated, which was affiliated with the Wagner Group. And I think a lot of young people, because they're using technology more and feel more adept and can talk to one another, are trying to find ways of building resilience, especially where influence campaigns are making media reporting less reliable or are undermining social cohesion because that's the big thing for many of these campaigners it's we need to ensure social cohesion by making sure we are accessing accurate information that is representative of what we want to say about ourselves so there's capacity for that it just goes back to political goodwill because if a government is not supporting those mechanisms to to thrive or in an environment where they can you know have training or open fora it becomes very difficult, but certainly there are groups that are trying to push for that. That again is is extremely positive to hear those developments, and uh, hopefully, you know, societies can learn from others that are making progress, which is something that that seems to be happening across Europe, albeit slowly and very very patchy. Because again, there are different different slants on things and different propaganda narratives play very differently you know whether you're in London or Serbia or wherever it happens to be. Um, Beverly, this is absolutely thrilling to speak to you. Your insights into into the region and and all of the latest uh, events are extraordinary. Um, and uh, well, thank you so much for generously sharing them with us. Thank you so much as well for your thoughtful questions and also for your own thoughts and insight around it. So I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much and good luck. Keep the great work up. Thank you. Same. So do you. And have a good weekend. <laughs> you 